After an extraordinary voyage from the Black Sea, Count Dracula arrived in England at Whitby on the northeast coast. The local people were appalled when they examined the ship. The crew had disappeared, the captain dead, lashed to the wheel. And then they saw the form of an immense dog which leapt ashore and bounded up the cliff towards the churchyard at the top. And of course, this was Dracula. I wonder if Count Dracula found this churchyard as odd as I do. This is, or at least it all began, as an investigation into the weird obsession of my great uncle. For he was the man who wrote Dracula, Bram Stoker, probably one of the least known authors of one of the best known books. And not only into his obsession, but apparently ours, for in creating the great vampire Dracula, he seems to have struck a chord that vibrates even more strongly today. It was in 1897 that Stoker wrote Dracula, but the name has leapt into the 20th century to become a household word. Today, the exploitation is even directed at children, with the temptation and delight of a Count Dracula ice lolly. Thank you very much. What does it exactly say on the lolly? Dracula's secret, now deadly than ever, with red, blood red jelly. Do you know what his secret was? No. No. <laughs> Any idea who Dracula was? Oh, the man. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, he was that man in the... Uh, what did he do now? Oh, yeah, he used to get up at nightfall, then he used to crawl round and... Uh, you know, bite people in the neck to keep him alive, and he had to get back in his coffin. That's right. By, uh, by daybreak. What would happen to him at daybreak? Uh, if he wasn't in his coffin, he'd uh, disintegrate. Ooh, we were not horrible. I think they're wrong. On a more serious and literary level, there's the Dracula Society, which invited me to dinner at Perfleet, Dracula's English home. But who would want to belong to such a society? And we've, we've got no advertising. It's all been word of mouth. We've just collected people. Uh, how many members have we got now? Well, uh, close on um, close on 90 at the moment. And are they cranks? Growing? No, by no means. We have, uh, uh, I suppose, by and large, uh, a fair cross-section of ordinary humanity. We have uh, quite a lot of uh, actors, uh, writers, people in the media. Uh, we have a Catholic priest and, uh, you know, quite a good assortment of people. <laughs> haven't you got one crank? <laughs> well, we haven't got to know them well enough yet to be quite sure We've of that. We've managed to avoid a few. So. We, 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 yes. we had a marvellous yeah, yeah. gentleman who rang me up on the phone one day, and uh, one of those strange sort of Peter Laurie voices, you know, do you, uh, do, are you the Dracula Society? I said, yes. And he said, uh, do, you, do you do ceremonies? So I said, well, you have to make that clear. What do you mean by ceremony? And I said, we, we have meetings. Yes. I said, what do you mean by ceremony? He said, well, well, you know. Well, the imagination a... boggles, of course. So, I mean, he may well have become a vampire. But no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy thought. Well, we must check. So <laughs> would you say that there are such things? The motto of our society is credo queer impossibile. I yes. believe because it is impossible. <laughs> um, there are people, of course, who have this delight in, in seeing blood mm. flow and in tasting blood. And uh, these people sometimes identify themselves with uh, vampires, and it's unusual. They identify themselves frequently with real-life people, like Napoleon. But I think possibly, with the exception of Sherlock Holmes, which, which cases have been known, Dracula is the only other fictional character with whom lunatics have been known to identify. And there was a very interesting case only last year, recounted by a, a, quite a, an experienced professional exorcist who helped uh, doctors in Scandinavian, a Scandinavian nursing home to treat one or two patients, one of whom was a young man who firmly believed that he was a vampire, although of course he was perfectly alive, and bit people in the throat and he needed to drink their blood to live. And he even bit the exorcist before the exorcism was performed. <laughs> now the strange thing about it was that this young man, although he lived in Norway, had a mother who came from Transylvania. And I think that here was a case of folk memory, the basis of uh, this belief being so strong amongst Transylvanian peoples, uh, had lingered through the with a stroke of brilliance, Bram Stoker opened Dracula here in Transylvania. There is such a place. This part of northern Romania was and is the perfect setting. 
It was through this countryside that Jonathan Harker, a young solicitor, started his journey to Castle Dracula. He came to make arrangements for the Count's visit to England and was startled as he stepped into the coach to see the peasants cross themselves when they heard of his destination. He is happily unaware at this stage that Count Dracula, who appears so real, is one of the living dead, a vampire. Dormant during the day, the vampire rises from his coffin at night to suck the blood of the living, who then become vampires themselves. Can any superstition be so unconvincing or absurd? Yet people have believed this since the beginning of time all over the world. Stoker discovered that legends of vampirism were especially rife in this part of Eastern Europe. Ignorance, sheer remoteness, belief in undead spirits, all helped to explain why vampirism seized the imagination. Yet, as Stoker learned from his research, many of the reports of vampirism were documented by local officials. This was not simply a peasant belief. Even today, visiting the painted monasteries in northern Romania, one can sense the strength of ancient superstition so deeply interwoven with Christian faith. The nun is using this curious ritual as a form of prayer, perhaps, as the frescoes on the wall suggest, to keep the devil at bay. These peasants are still deeply religious. On Sundays, their churches are crowded. They take their faith seriously. The idea of excommunication has always been a threat, with the souls of those who have offended cast into limbo and denied the freedom of death. Such fear would enhance any belief in the undead. When religion is strong, so is the determination to protect yourself against the devil. It is easy to understand their agitation when an epidemic of vampirism swept across Eastern Europe in the middle of the 18th century. An historian of the time recorded, we are told that dead men return from their tombs, are heard to speak, to walk about, to injure both men and animals whose blood they drain, finally causing their death. Nor can men deliver themselves unless they drive a sharp stake through these bodies, cut off the heads, tear out the hearts. He concluded, it seems impossible not to subscribe to the belief that these apparitions do actually come forth from their graves. When I watched this funeral in Romania, I was startled to see that the corpse was carried outside by the family with the body exposed for the villagers to pay their last respects. If by some chance the body should have appeared to be sleek with blood, how easy to believe that the man was an undead. But such beliefs belonged to the distant past, or so I thought, until I spoke to one of the funeral singers, a woman called Tinker, whose own father was suspected of being a vampire. Can I ask her, when she was a girl yes. and um, in her village, yes. um, when her father died, uh, why did the family think something was wrong? Can I first meet her? The villagers, when uh, want to dress their father, 
his uh, corpse a soft. It was not stiff with rigor mortis. Stiff, yes, mm -hmm. and observed this, and uh, she said uh, the villager uh, putting the stake in the heart. The stake in the heart. Stake in the heart. Yeah. The, the villagers were afraid that he might become a vampire. Yes, this is uh, true. It is pretty startling to hear first hand of a man being staked as a vampire. But to my mind, it is obvious that Tinker's father must have been still alive. Curiously, it's extremely difficult to certify death. Only a few months ago in Birmingham, a corpse was being dissected for a kidney transplant when it was discovered that the corpse was in fact alive. If we can make such mistakes today, with all our medical knowledge, just imagine the confusion a hundred years ago when people were mystified by states of trance and catalepsy and epilepsy. And if the coffins of these people were broken into by grave robbers or body snatchers, it would be noticed that the bodies had moved. And sometimes there'd be blood around the mouth where they had bitten themselves in anguish. And it was claimed that parts of the shroud or even the bodies themselves had been bitten in the last desperate attempt to stay alive. Of course, they could equally have been gnawed by rats or devoured by insects. On a more cheerful note, premature burial was so common that it gave rise to this limerick. There was a young man of none head who awoke in his coffin of lead. It's cosy enough, he remarked in a huff, but I wasn't aware I was dead. Premature burial was rife in times of plague, which is understandable uh, because people were terrified by the risk of infection and anxious to dispose of the bodies as quickly as possible. But of course, this meant that a number of people uh, who might have recovered, who were perhaps only in a drunken stupor, were thrust into the earth and woke to find themselves incarcerated in the darkness. If they got out and were noticed, this again could have led to rumours of vampires which would have spread like a form of mass hysteria. Bram Stoker knew about the plague. His mother Charlotte was a young girl in County Sligo when the cholera epidemic swept across Europe to Western Ireland. My grandmother, Enid Stoker, told me a horrifying family story of how when the uh, cholera epidemic was at its peak and the house barricaded against looters and the last survivors in the village, Charlotte saw a hand creeping through the skylight, took an ax and cut it off. And my grandmother was not a fanciful woman. Maybe hearing such stories when he was a child, this gave Bram his first taste for horror. He was a strange mixture, outwardly a genial, red-bearded giant. But this bluff facade concealed a man who found a release in horror and the occult. Ironically, he never enjoyed fame or fortune himself, but his book has never been out of print, and countless books have been written since by other authors on the theme of Dracula and vampirism. Somewhere throughout the world at this moment, Dracula is being produced on stage. And as for films, there have been so many, the books are now being written about them. Here at the Lorimer Press in London, they are publishing the latest work on vampire films. This seems to me a pretty strong candidate. It's got nice contrast of colours to it. also sums up a lot of Dracula themes here. Have you any idea how many films have been on vampires and Dracula? A couple of hundred. It's very hard to keep accurate documentation on this kind of thing because they stretch into they stretch into the darker areas. There are the porno films, there are people's eight millimeter versions, there are the stuff made that's the stuff made in Mexico and in Spain. There's um, a man called Paul Nashi who um, in the last um, Paul Nashi, the hunchback of the morgue, who seems to have started off the entire Spanish fantasy film industry. And he regularly plays a wolfman involved with fighting vampires. But Dracula's the star. I've just been to a convention of films, uh, fantastic films in Paris. And at one stage, they pulled out a film and um, put in a, a Mexican film, Santo versus the Treasure of Dracula. The moment the man said the word Dracula, there was this great ripple of applause running around the audience. And they started chanting, Dracula, Dracula. But I think the Dracula we have in film is still that of Stoke. Of course, he's undergone modification. He's had this, all the whole business with the opera cloak and Kane and so on came in really with Lugosi and has continued with Christopher Lee. The head of Hammer Films is Michael Carreras. Well, that's our latest diversification, Dan. When you started, 
and in a way created the Dracula industry 20 years ago, did you have any concept of the sensational success it would be? It would be a terrible lie if I said yes. <laughs> no, it, it really did. It was like a dam bursting. There was all over the world a complete uh, readiness for that uh, type of entertainment to be revitalised. And of course, coming back in colour, it just caused a sensation. To what extent did the recreation by Hammer of uh, Count Dracula save the British film industry? Oh, I think to a large extent. Uh, not only the Dracula films themselves, but the actual spin-offs from the idea of reviving horror has uh, really, I think, been a great saviour for not only this camp company, but many, many other producers have jumped on the horror bandwagon. Do you, do you find yourself that people are fascinated by the idea of horror because they find the present unacceptable? Well, that, of course, is one of the many theories. Uh, I think I subscribe to it to a great deal. I mean, the here is a, an adrenaline excitement uh, and a horror titillation, which, in actual fact, you don't carry with you into the streets after the experience in the cinema. Uh, the modern horror, which uh, are now, I suppose, you can call mainly social documents, I think, far more frightening, and uh, those are things that you do carry into the streets with you. And modern horror like Belfast. And, uh... Yes. Well, yeah. Are you proud of your industry? Very. But what gets them off the streets and into the cinema is not simply the horror, but the sexuality of the vampire. Though Stoker might have been unaware of it himself, the original novel is blatantly erotic, as Denham Elliott realised when he portrayed Dracula on television. And to, to illustrate the, um, the sort of sexuality of the Dracula, from the, particularly in the original, I'd like, if I may, to read a passage from the original book. This is one of Dracula's daughters attacking the hero. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat. And she paused. And I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and could feel the hot breath on my neck. And the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer, nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in a languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. Mm. The symbolism of that is pretty obvious, isn't it? I think it's the feeling of being totally taken in and absorbed in, and the, and the whole thing of um, a total absence of any responsibility. Uh, you're totally contained, sexually, mentally, spiritually, by this lover, really, you see. Did you enjoy the devouring? Well, actually, to be quite frankly, that isn't really my scene, but... Um, <laughs> I did enjoy playing it. It was fun. You know, yes, I did. I didn't take Dracula too seriously. I don't think it's... I, um, I couldn't afford to. I think you play, you play very dangerous games when you play around with people like Dracula. I think you can get terribly involved in the idea of Satan if you let yourself. It really is a very frightening. I, 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 you know, I have to, really to, to keep an absolute balance in one's mind because I think you can become totally involved in yes. sure erotic enjoyment if you really let yourself go. And it can go beyond oblivion yeah. into obliteration of Well, that's it, you see. You lose your soul, which is what they're after. Now! Very good. Very good. Very good. Well, next one. How stunned my poor old great-uncle might have been by these scenes and by the hard professionalism that goes into the making of this latest style of vampire film. Uh, now, let me give you a rough idea. If we were lined up on this, uh, you're dead right. Try exactly like this. Ah, ah. And come that, like that. And turn like that, and go. Like that, that, uh, that is the thing. I won't be able to hold it there. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. One moment, one moment. You come again alive with your hands like this, when I say action, and it's when you do me, bang, bang, bang. Just to put you in the picture, the two girls are lesbian vampires, carrying the exploitation of the original novel to the absolute limit. Four, one, four, take one, die track. Action. Very good. 
finish up with her in the foreground and her in the background. Good. It's yeah. good. Looks good. Oh, yeah, but the way she rolled over in the background. Did Don't you, move an inch, you, you now. It's still like that, oh, all the time. Mean? Please. The latest to climb on the Dracula bandwagon are the travel agencies, encouraged by the Romanians, who have just discovered the immense tourist potential on their Transylvanian doorstep, the Dracula Package Tour. This brings the tourist following eagerly, hard on the footsteps of Stoker's hero, young Jonathan Harker. of Dracula, Dracula films, and I just lap those yes. up. <laughs> and when you saw the name Dracula mentioned in the tour, it... Oh, that click. was in... Oh, yes, yes. Because there's so much fiction, I wanted to see if there was any fact behind yes. it. which of course there is. Of course there is, yes. There must be a certain amount. Please, come on. That is the main entrance to the castle, lying on a 60 meters uh, high rock. But the fact remains, the Count Dracula is simply a figment of Stoker's imagination. This way, please. And this is simply a Romanian castle called Bran, which happens to be spookily appropriate. However, this does not seem to diminish the appeal. The ever-curious Americans blazed the trail. 6,000 Spanish Dracula aficionados are booked this year, and now the British can indulge in their fantasies. Well, what do you do in England? I'm a teacher in a grammar school. Uh, what did the school children say when they heard you were coming out here? <laughs> I told a group of them that I was visiting Dracula for my half-term holiday, so they were rather amazed and yes. a bit apprehensive in case I didn't get back. The Romanians now find themselves in a dilemma. It is only recently that they've even heard of Bram Stoker's Dracula, but they have a real one of their own. Vlad Dracul was born here in the old Saxon town of Sigisora in 1431. He became the ruler of Wallachia, but there was no such country as Romania then, only the three states of Wallachia, Moldavia and Transylvania. Though he was certainly bloodthirsty, Dracula was no vampire. He was a warrior, and after one of his battles against the Turks, the bells rang out as far as the island of Rhodes to celebrate the victory of Christendom. He made his capital here, in Turga Vista. He was a man of really exceptional cruelty, even for his own time. He was known as Vlad Sepes, which means Vlad the Impaler, because of his habit of impaling his enemies on sharp, pointed stakes, which slowly split them apart until after several hours or even days they died. And seldom can death have been so welcome. After one battle, he impaled as many as 20,000 of his enemies and amid the screams and the smells at a cheerful lunch underneath. Here in his castle at Turgovista, when a visiting deputation of Turkish ambassadors failed to doff their turbans in his presence, he ordered that the turbans be nailed to their heads. He was cruel, but he had a certain style. Today, Romanian children are taught that Dracula is a national hero, without too much stress on his cruelty. It is to historical monuments like this one, a Turga Vista, that today's tourists are being taken, alongside the Children's Pioneer Corps. Nothing to do with Bram Stoker's Count Dracula at all. Yet Stoker got the atmosphere absolutely right, all from books in the British Museum, for, amazingly, he never set foot in Transylvania himself. The town of Bistrita is the town of Bistritz that he wrote about. If you go there, you can find the same small type of hotel that Jonathan Harker might have stayed at.
and, incredibly enough, across the street, an undertaker's. It out Stoker Stoker. Jonathan Harker travelled by coach through the Borgo Pass. It is there, and it is almost too good to be true, with lonely crosses and swirling mists. But there is no Castle Dracula for the tourists. The Romanians, in pursuit of hard currency, have come up with the answer. In the of action, Dracula, sunt cele trei turnuri, așa cum da. scrie Bram Stoker în roman. Da. Este o construcție în stil românesc. Da. The Castle Dracula Hotel, a mixture of Disney and Diaghilev, with taped wolves howling as the tourists are driven through the pass, is to be opened hopefully in 1977. Da. Meanwhile, Bran Castle will do. At least the tourists are there and the currency is starting to flow. At the moment, there's an innocent bewilderment amongst the Romanians. For their souvenirs, a bit behind the times, feature that other 20th century figure, Mickey Mouse. But Count Dracula is about to push him aside. The local plum brandy, Dracula, you know, D-R-A, there it is, the way down the bottle there. Three star, too. Frankly, I'm slightly bewildered by this obsession with Dracula. It seems to be deeper than just an amusing gimmick. Uh, the infatuation with the idea of vampires, uh, sucking of blood, uh, and indeed perpetual life is peculiar, but perhaps it is a part of the general resurgence of interest in the occult, uh, which is greater in Britain today than it has been for the last few hundred years. The interest is intense. One London bookshop concentrates entirely on the occult, science fiction, and the ramifications of the Dracula cult. Catering to this insatiable appetite for horror, and also man's apparent need to believe in the inexplicable. I find it quite extraordinary to come into a bookshop like this and see masses of people all buying books on vampires and Dracula. Uh, what, what one have you got? I've got In Search of Dracula. Why do you find the subject exciting? Well, I suppose, um, uh, feeling rather aggressive, perhaps. Who? Well, my husband left me and I felt very angry about it. And as I couldn't do anything to him, so I suppose I took up a fantasy violence instead. I'm sorry, I really don't get this. Um, you're interested in the idea of vampires because your husband left you? Yes. I was very annoyed about it. Well, I, I should think you were. Yes, but I, I couldn't do anything to him in the way of attacking him or hurting him in any way. So I'd end up in prison, obviously. But who do you... So it's much safer to do it this way, isn't it? By who, fantasy. Who are you associating with? Well, Dracula or the victim or...? <laughs> oh, Dracula. <laughs> Not the victim. And you would like to, um, so to speak, uh, in, in the books, uh, devour your ex-husband? Not devour, exactly. I suppose just kill him rather nastily. Do you think that's healthy? No. <laughs> Far more unhealthy is the current vandalism in cemeteries, breaking open graves and disturbing bodies. Mr. Law is the cemetery keeper at Highgate. I asked if there really were vampire hunters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some couple of years ago, there's this uh, person named Farrant. He's uh, supposed to have seen a vampire or something over and over the top of a headstone. And then from then, we had nothing else but vampire hunters, smashing open tombs, sticking stakes through bodies, and all this nonsense. Did anyone describe this vampire that was in? Well, he's supposed to have described it as a big, tall thing over in seven foot. In, uh, no, seven foot over the top of a headstone and about seven foot tall. Of course, he'd only probably seen things like this. We've gone up the road, had a few pints of grog and a couple of glass yard mm. stuff. <laughs> well, do you, think, do you think it was all complete imagination? Oh, stupid. Nonsense. I worked here all night long. All day long, all night long. I've never seen nothing, so I mean, I don't see why they should see something. But well, there have been quite a few vampire hunters here, haven't there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How many altogether? Well, I couldn't tell you exactly how many. This, this time when they started this vampire business, in the evening time, there's all hundred-odd people outside the gates 
when the cemetery's all closed. I mean, it's all privately owned, you see, so those gates are closed at, uh, at uh, four o'clock at this particular time. And uh, they was all trying to climb over the walls, and one person said, they see a horrible grey thing wriggling down the road, all this bloody nonsense, you know. And uh, they had to have the police to clear them all off out of it. This was ordinary, supposed to be educated people. A hundred vampire hunters? Oh, yes. Ordinary people? Ordinary people. Ordinary people? Perhaps. But it is an extraordinary obsession. Last year, in this house in Stoke-on-Trent, a man was found dead in most extraordinary circumstances. I asked the coroner what these were. Well, the circumstances were these. It was reported to me as a sudden death of which the cause was unknown. And when I had the post-mortem done, the pathologist uh, <coughs> said he swallowed either a pickled onion or a clove of garlic, which I thought was rather unusual. But never mind, these things do happen. People do bolt their food and die. But I had the advantage of a very good report from a young PC in the force, which went into it very thoroughly. And it came out that this man believed in vampires and was frightened of vampires and took various precautions to stop the vampires getting at him. What, what precautions? Well, I think I'd better read a bit out of the PC's report. Uh, or refer to it anyhow. He had the room strewn with salt in what the PC described as a ritual fashion. He had a bag of salt between his legs resting on his testicles. He had garlic round the room and in addition he had outside on the windowsill an inverted bowl covering human excreta and also garlic in the middle of it. Now apparently salt and garlic are vampire repellents. He mixed salt with his urine in various containers, also outside with his excreta, apparent uh, salt, I'm sorry, garlic. The idea being apparently that the vampire would be attracted by this uh, magnificent feed of excreta or urine and would then swallow it on the principle of the rat bait and be poisoned by the garlic. To make assurance doubly sure, he put this garlic into his mouth and unfortunately choked on it and died. Would you say that in fact the man was mad? No. Obsessed, perhaps. This man believed thoroughly that these vampires existed. This case sounds unique, yet incredibly, there are other cases of vampirism in Britain today, as I learned from the Reverend Neil Smith when I asked if he knew of specific instances. Uh, yes, um, uh, more than one. I mean, one particularly strikes me is that of a woman who showed me the, the marks on her wrists um, which appeared at night and uh, definitely where the blood had been taken from her wrists at night and the marks were there in the morning and there's no apparent reason why this should have occurred. What sort of marks? Well, the marks are almost like that of an animal. I mean, like a, a scratching. But couldn't she have done this herself? Well, um, she's a married woman and there's no evidence from her husband or otherwise that such things uh, did occur in the night. And she came to you for help? She came to me for help, but she felt that she, her blood was being sucked. And did you perform an exorcism on her? Yes, I did. And what happened? And uh, this, these marks cleared up. How recent was this? Oh, not very long ago. It's a matter of months. Do you know of other examples when there was physical evidence? Yes, there was a man from South America who had a similar phenomenon at night, and uh, the blood had been sucked from him and the marks were on him, and he showed me the uh, marks. And uh, again, after the exorcism, they disappeared. Were they um, marks of uh, uh, baiting, or...? Yes, again, like a this sort of strange little phenomenon of an an like an animal. Uh, as if an animal had uh, you know, uh, sucked away his, his, his bud and, and uh, attacked him at night. You don't think he just had an extremely uh, exciting sexual night somewhere? And no, no, I, no, I think that, uh, um, you know, he's, he was sufficiently in, in intelligent to reckon that this was abnormal. But surely any sane person would regard the idea of vampirism as absurd. No, I, I wouldn't think so, because uh, I think I've found that people in dealing with exorcism, it's a more 
intelligent people, I would think, who would accept such ideas uh, more easily than the less intelligent. Because they would be more open-minded regarding, um, uh, well, spirits and forces outside themselves. And you would categorically say that there is, in fact, then an evil force of energy around us, and that this could attack uh, you or me, um, perhaps not you, but anyone, any ordinary person in the street? Oh, yes, it could to me as well. I mean, I'm in danger in doing exorcism, but the thing could come on to me. Uh, I mean, I admit this, and uh, I believe that uh, the devil has his agents, and these are the demons all around the place. And are we all vulnerable? I, I, I can't think that people could say that they are never vulnerable. I think it's a dangerous uh, idea, because uh, maybe just when they're saying that, that something may attack them. It is just this dabbling with the occult that so many people regard as dangerous. Recently, it has assumed the scale of an epidemic, especially in our cities. In the reassuring setting of a vicarage in Hull, I spoke to the Reverend Willis. He is a family man with both feet firmly on the ground, but he is seriously worried by today's fascination with the Ouija board, seances and witches' covens. He believes that this presents the church with a real problem. Um, clergy all over the country have been deluged with people coming to them for help because um, either it's induced a mental breakdown with a lot of people ending up in mental hospitals, uh, a lot of people are uh, driven to attempted suicide in this area at any rate, and uh, in other areas I know there have been several cases of real suicide from people um, playing around with Ouija boards even, or just consulting mediums or fortune tellers. Have you yourself ever had real evidence that makes you believe in the devil? In one particular case, I remember, the, a family had rung up the Samaritan service who in turn asked myself and another priest to go along and help a family who were in terror out in the street. We got the family back into the house and um, after having talked to them for some time, um, one of the women complained that, that something was around her, a horrible coldness, and could I help her? Could I go over there and pray with her? And I went across the room to her, and she began to say, please, please help me, because I'm, I'm, it's around me. I've gone all cold. It's, 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 it's all around me. Please help. Please. Please help me. Please help me. And she began to struggle with something around her throat. She began to physically choke. And I read plenty of times in fiction of people saying, uh, you know, that their eyes bulged in terror. But this is the first time I ever really saw it myself. Her eyes came right out of the sockets and bulged like this. <laughs> Help me. And, and she was struggling. And I thought, well, is this some sort of psychological flip? You know, some hysteria. So for a while, uh, a few seconds, I didn't do anything. But eventually, she, she got so desperate and was obviously choking, that I thought I must do something. And I must assume that this is, this is something evil around her. And I went over to her and um, said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I command you to come out of her and go to that place appointed for you. And nothing happened. Uh, and, and for a moment I was puzzled. But then I remember reading, um, that, that, that sometimes people in, involved in exorcism have a big struggle. So I kept on uh, with this same command, on and on, several times, over perhaps 10 or 15 seconds, which is quite a long time, really. Uh, and, and eventually, she collapsed on the floor. Uh, we took a glass of water to her and brought her around, but for a quarter of an hour, she wouldn't, she wouldn't talk about it. She just couldn't talk about it. She was so frightened. But eventually, we said, well, what happened? And she said, I just, something just completely took over me. I felt as though I was being pushed out of myself. I, I'm, I'm convinced I would have died if you hadn't begun to do something. And she said, I heard your voice in the dim distance um, praying. And gradually, she said, I seemed to come back into myself. And I said, well, what did you actually see or feel? And she said, the only thing I saw w w was, was a face uh, which looked like a doll with, with staring eyes absolutely hypnotizing me. I just couldn't take my, f my eyes off it. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I blacked out. Um, well, I prayed with her, prayed with the family. We eventually went and blessed the whole house. And after some time, they said, we feel completely at peace now.
whatever it is has gone. I returned home and um, creeping upstairs with my, my shoes in my hand, <laughs> um, found my, my wife wide awake, sat up in bed saying, Phew, thank goodness you're back. I said, why, what's the matter? She said, I've had the most terrible nightmare of my life. And I said, well, what was the matter? She said, well, it was only a dream, but she said, I felt there was something evil uh, in the house attacking myself and the children. Um, she said, in my dream, I, I, I met it in the sitting room. I went downstairs and met it in the sitting room and got hold of it and smashed it in the name of the Trinity against the wall and a blue liquid came out. Uh, when I woke up, she said, I was so scared by it and I went round and prayed with all the children uh, and have been awake ever since. So I said, well, what was it that you broke? What was it you saw? And she said, well, it was something horrible and evil, like, like a doll. Good. So, uh, so something, however you view it, happened, passed between the two houses. My wife didn't know, she knew I'd been called out on something, but she knew nothing of the circumstances we'd been dealing with. Somehow something flashed between the two houses, whether it was some telepathic um, vision of some kind, or whether it was evil hitting back at my family, um, of course is, is open to, to controversy. You don't think that possibly, because you are a member of the church and in a way associated with the devil and with evil, that uh, you could induce this yourself? I don't think so, because you see that the problem was there before I was ever called in. Yes. You know, um, I didn't go around and, and give them the idea that, that, that there could be some sort of possession. That they rang up the Samaritans and said, please, there's something in our house. Can you send us someone who'll help? What can the church and what should the church do about the problem? Um, I think we have got to um, restudy um, Christian belief about, about evil about the teaching of Christ about evil. After all, Christ gave three commands to the church, um, preach the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out evil. And we've rather neglected um, the casting out of evil. Uh, and um, we haven't met much of it in, in the last 300 years. In Britain uh, and Western Europe, not many people have dabbled in witchcraft or devil worship or even consulting fortune tellers to any great number. There always have been a few. But suddenly in the 20th century, we've got this occult explosion, everybody doing it, uh, and it's, it's a social problem. At Nashtram Abbey, I asked Dom Petitpierre, who is greatly respected as an authority on the subject, for his explanation of the resurgence of the occult in 1974. Well, I think it's due to a number of causes myself. Uh, first of all, it's a reaction against the old materialism of last century and a good deal of the modern thinking that mental problems are entirely concerned within, inside oneself. And this is a looking for something outside uh, and deeper than merely materialistic considerations. The desperate need to believe in something. In something. And because the, the Christian churches have got caught up with making noises and nothing much else, they haven't taught what we call contemplative prayer. Uh, people are looking for something beyond themselves. That's another factor. So would you say the church has failed? Yes, I think so. I think it's kept up a sort of 19th, 18th, 19th century idea that everybody is a Christian and knows their stuff. And of course, it isn't true <laughs> now. And I think there's a third reason, and that is that modern civilization is so utterly impersonal that in the occult groups you get a deeply personal relationship with about 12 people and this is of great value to the young but why should man want to embrace the devil and evil well i'm not quite sure that the occult groups are looking out for the devil or evil i remember one young man who said he'd been going to a black magic group for two years and lucifer was marvelous he didn't see Lucifer as anti-God. He just saw Lucifer as something big beyond himself. What will happen in the future, do you think? Will the devil win? Will we... Oh, no. The devil never wins. He gets occasional <laughs> victories, but no final success. Back in Romania, where the whole Dracula business started, it is rather ironic that the frescoes on the churches still reflect the eternal struggle between Christianity and the devil. A few months ago, I did not believe in the devil, and most certainly I did not believe in vampires, and I don't think I do now. But I do realize that there's this yearning among people today to believe in something. 
as they see the cities destroyed around them, the landscape scarred, all in the pursuit of material gain, there's this ache for something better and less artificial, a return to more spiritual values, be it a, a less soulless way of life, even if that means the occult. But this is a subject that defies any neat conclusion.